My guest is John Shule, co-founder of Eco Restoration Alliance. John, how are you doing today? Very good, Hart. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, your topic is dueling paradigms, implications for action, and the big map to save the future. Can you explain what we'll be talking about? Yeah, um, sorry about the long title. Um, I think that we're at a particular moment in human history where there are in fact two paradigms, two ways of understanding our place in the natural world. Uh, and they have very different implications for action. Uh, one of them I fear is going to steer us over, over the edge of the cliff. And the other, I hope, could take us to the future we and our children deserve. And so in the talk, I'm gonna to try to tease these two paradigms out, um, show that they have really different implications, and then talk about how I think one of their implications is that if we're going to save the future, we need to engage almost everyone, almost everywhere. And I have a pet project of my own with the Eco Restoration Alliance called the Big Map to Save the Future, which is at least an example of what it might be like to get almost everyone, almost everywhere on the same page, doing what needs to happen to save the future. And doing what needs to happen means recognizing that the natural world holds it all together and that we need to restore every patch of dirt we can get our hands on in order to restore the climate and the biosphere's ability to create conditions that we can live in. Sounds fascinating. Uh, why don't you go ahead and share with us your slide presentation? Okay. So here we are. Uh, we're at this really interesting moment right now, but it's getting hotter and hotter and it's getting more and more worrisome. If we're going to end up, and if you're colorblind folks, I, I apologize, but if we're gonna end up in the upper right happy green corner, we're going to have to engage in effective action. And effective action, I'm beginning to think, requires proper understanding, but that won't be enough. It requires a sense of agency, the idea that we can do something about this, but that's not enough because we need to do the right things. And we need community in order to mobilize each other, support each other and work together. I believe that effective action is not too late, but I think it's our only hope. And so the question is, how do we get there? Right, so it's not enough to take action. It must be effective action. And you're saying effective action is a combination, a blend of understanding agency and community. That's my story. And and what, what does agency mean in this context? It means a sense that you can do something about it. Right, exactly. Which is to say that um, we're coming out of a period of naive complacency in which astoundingly um, the planet was giving us everything we needed to live, most of us. Um, our numbers were growing, we were thriving, but it's beginning to change. And people are beginning to notice that it's changing. It's not just that we've been warned that it's changing, we can actually feel it changing year by year, which means it's changing fast and it's changing faster and faster. That's exponential degradation. And so everyone, sooner or later, is going to begin to develop a sense of urgency. And that is either very good news or very bad news. If the urgency leads to agency and hope, well, we'll talk about what can happen. But if the urgency leads to a sense that there's nothing we can do about it, you're gonna end up in a world of despair. And that world of despair is going to turn to panic flailing, conflict, and ultimately tragedy and lost opportunity, extinctions, deaths, drought, 
all of the horses of the apocalypse and then some that they didn't even think of back in the day. And it's a problem. The catch is that agency and hope, as I said earlier, are not sufficient. Let me just uh, follow the path through so far. So we've got a really good flow chart here. In the beginning, there was naive complacency because the earth gave us everything we needed. And then we started to perceive that there was exponential degradation. And that leads to a sense of urgency. And that sense of urgency can go in two directions, agency and hope, or it can go to non-agency and despair, which leads to panic, which leads to flailing and conflict, which leads to tragedy and lost opportunity. And that's the direction we don't want to go in, right? Well, that's right. And yet I feel that we may, many of us are on that track right now. Many more of us are being given a sense that they can do something just by abolishing plastic straws or con converting to um, electric vehicles. And that's based on a misunderstanding of the real condition. And misunderstanding and bad guidance, while it may make us feel good in the very short term, is going to again lead to misdirected action and bring us right back to the same future we're actually trying to avoid. That's what makes this moment so perilous. So what you're saying is that this fork in the road between non-agency and despair toward agency and hope, agency and hope sounds better, but it could still lead in the wrong direction if there's misunderstanding and bad guidance, and which naturally leads to misdirected action. That's right. In contrast, if the agency and hope is informed by good understanding and good guidance, then what people do with their sense of agency is they engage in actual meaningful effective action. They change the world for the better and they change themselves for the better because there's the real possibility that you and me and everyone else who uh, tries to save the planet the right way in the next decade are going to be responsible for saving the future, for restoration of the biosphere, for a new and enlightened attitude towards our place in the world, towards a sustainable economy, and towards thriving for humans and animals and all other living things because we're all in it together. It's potentially a truly great moment to be celebrated mm -hmm. for the tragedy of everyone's lifetime. Right. This is not just hypothetical. The point is the standard model, the one that I'm going to be talking about uh, in the next part of the talk for understanding climate change is, I claim, clear, simple, and dangerously misleading, and it's bringing us back down here. In contrast, there is a living earth paradigm, which we'll be talking about. It's a little more complex but it's a lot more actionable. And if you just compare these diagrams, I don't expect you to, read, to, to see what they say, you can see that the standard model is not wrong, but you know, roughly four more bubbles and you've actually got a complete account that you can use well. And so we're gonna talk about that. Yeah. So when you, say, when you say the standard model is not wrong, we'll put a bookmark there and maybe not talking about it this time, but I question how right the standard model is. It, it seems to me to be going completely in the wrong direction, but you know, but you know, there's only so much you, I'll, I'll let you deal with that in your own time. Well, I think we'll get there. Um, I okay. think it does bring us in the wrong direction, the same way that a, um, a navigational system that's broken on one side it's gonna do what it was designed to do, but send us veering off to the, to the right. Mm -hmm. We need a well-balanced navigational system and that's the proper understanding we wanna to work towards. So let's talk about the, um, the half of the model, which is dangerously misleading. The model says, listen, it's a simple linear chain of causation. We started burning fossil fuels a few hundred years ago. That has elevated greenhouse gases. That produces this greenhouse effect that everybody in elementary school learns about. That produces climate change, and that's producing the eco-crisis. As the world gets hotter because of the greenhouse gas effect, 
we're all in trouble. So just to articulate, let me repeat this articulation of the standard model, which is what we hear most of the time when we hear about climate. Right. Uh, the, there was a lot of fossil fuel combustion starting about 200 years ago. That leads to elevated greenhouse gases, uh, mainly carbon dioxide. This causes the greenhouse effect and which causes climate change, which causes the ecological crisis. And when we see the ecological crisis, that's like floods and droughts and heat waves and famines. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> and the standard model has a very straightforward prescription to go along with the diagnosis. If the diagnosis is correct and complete, we can fix this by reducing fossil fuels because that will stop the greenhouse gases and that will reverse the greenhouse effect and stop climate change and everybody will be happy, except there are some problems. One is the pesky oceans. Mm. Right? Two thirds of the planet is water. Um, something like 99.5% of that is salt water in the oceans. And the oceans are filled with CO2. And because there's so much of that, it's gonna take literally centuries for greenhouse gas levels to go down, even if we stop emissions completely tomorrow, because oceanic CO2 is in dynamic equilibrium with atmospheric CO2. If you lower the CO2 in the atmosphere, the CO2 will be outgassed from the oceans and it will take a very long time to drain that swamp. So it, even according to the standard model, they don't talk about this, but I don't think anyone can deny this. Right. Um, stopping emissions will merely stop the increase in CO2. It's a good thing and may be critical for saving the oceans, which are becoming dangerously acidified, Right. but is not going to address the whole issue. Right. Furthermore, before we started burning carbon fuels, the real story began. Humans, over the course of a few 10,000s of years, have deforested and desertified much of the planet. Here's 8,000 years of history. You can see that forests are vanishing. Even where we didn't have forests, we had grasslands. And by the way, if you believe in carbon, grasslands held even more carbon than forests. Right, right. And so here you have uh, 9,000 years of African history. But here's the thing. It's not critically about carbon. Mm -hmm. Droughts don't cause deserts. What the living earth paradigm helps us understand is that deserts cause droughts. And we'll explain how in a moment. Could you and go civilization, back to the, Could you go back to the last slide just a minute? Just one click back. So what we're, you're doing here, John, is you're introducing a new paradigm that we don't hear about very much at all. This is a paradigm that says it's not all about CO2 and fossil fuels. It's a more complex system and uh, abuse of the land and water is a big part of the problem in this living earth paradigm. And the abuse of land and the water has caused the eco crisis. That's right. And it's not just a big part of the problem, it's the beginning of the problem. Um, if this is a timeline, notice that abuse of land and water happened 10,000 years, 20,000 years, 30,000 years before fossil fuel combustion. Mm -hmm. That in itself triggered an eco crisis in which forests and grasslands turned into desert. And all of the carbon that was in this area, the size of the United States, just in Africa alone, had to go somewhere and it goes into the atmosphere. There's actually, 
Hang on. There is actually more carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere by land degradation than has been produced by fossil fuels. But it's not just CO2. There's a huge amount of water in rich living soil and it had to go somewhere right. and it went into the atmosphere along with dust. And so all of that land that blew into the sky turns out to be a greenhouse gas that captures heat much more, like 20 to 50 times more than CO2. So even the greenhouse effect is more due to land degradation than it is to fossil fuel combustion. But folks, greenhouse gases are a sideshow. It's not the key issue. Loss of foliage, loss of all of that living vegetation supported by microorganisms in the soil and maintained by animals who help regulate the foliage, all of that biodiversity is the planet's refrigeration system. When water is, is many things, but water, I was taught in high school physics that water is like the number two on the list of how slowly they absorb heat and how slowly they release heat. So it's a buffer, it's a regulator. And when you lose that water at any particular locality or region, or even within an organism, when you lose that water, you lose that, you, you tend to get more extremes of temperature. Not only do you get more extremes, but you lose a process which adapts to climatic fluctuations, and you lose a process that takes the heat from where we live on the surface of the ground and moves it up into the sky where people don't live, and from there to outer space. Here we go. All the modern plagues, warming, storming, fire. Fire? You've got these forest fires. We've got all of this burning going on. Well, dry land is easy to burn. And it's dry because it doesn't absorb water. And so the dead trees fuel the flames. And there's nothing to reverse that cycle. Similarly, as we saw, dry land is non-absorbent, it's compacted. And so if it rains, you get floods. And of course, if you have warming, storing, fire, floods, dry, bare land, you have famine. And as we have seen drought caused by this loss of plant-based rain and water cycling, and runoff, and zoonotic diseases like AIDS, Ebola, COVID, and who knows what comes next as the breakdown of fractured ecosystems unleashes and releases all sorts of um, bacteria that had their place there, but are now breaking into areas of human population. And of course, all of this heat and all of this loss of water from the land causes sea level rise. And it is all fixable all fixable by eco-restoration. And so here we are again, carbon tunnel vision is can we, an obsession. Let's, uh, can we go back one slide just a minute? Sure. So you say all fixable via eco-restoration. Let's just briefly name a couple of examples of that. Well, taking it from the top, if, so plants, as we said earlier, are a refrigeration system. By drawing water from the aquifers and producing vapor, a huge amount of energy is packed into the water vapor. We all know that uh, forests are cool, they're cool, because they are releasing energy packed water vapor, which rises up into the sky when it condenses, and it condenses also because the plants have sent along aerobacteria that enhances the condensation. 
when it condenses, all of that energy is released in the upper atmosphere and some of it goes out into space. It is literally a refrigeration system. You lose plants, you lose that. Similarly, fires, floods, famine, drought, runoff, all of those things can be understood as consequences of dead, dry dirt rather than moist living soil, all of which can be attributed to the loss of water and life that maintain each other and so on. Mm -hmm. Great. So we continue. I want to talk about the paradigms that we're uh, wrestling with. And I want to take a moment and try to find Hart's picture so that I can see his face. <laughs> and yet, where did he go? All right, Hart, you're just going to have to interrupt when you okay. want to get my attention. Okay. I want to contrast the standard model with the living earth paradigm because I want to show that they lead us in very different actions. According to the standard model, carbon in the atmosphere is the main problem. According to the living earth paradigm, it's a long-term problem, but it's a short-term obsession that is distracting us from all of these other interrelated problems, all of which can be addressed as we've seen in a different way through eco-restoration. According to the standard model, you might ask how long is it gonna to take to restore greenhouse gas levels? Which is what the standard model focuses on. The answer is, as we've seen centuries, people typically say a thousand years. The living earth paradigm says, you know, actually greenhouse CO2 itself has relatively little impact on us. What we care about are normal temperatures and normal weather. And how rapidly can we restore normal temperatures? Merely in years. Mm -hmm. Plants grow fast. Given half a chance, you can have huge differences in the environment in years or decades. This is good news because we only have years and decades. We don't have centuries. Right. And one reason that uh, it can happen quickly is that we're talking about an increase in plant matter. When you increase the percentage of the earth that's covered with plant matter, then that lowers temperatures pretty quickly, pretty quickly. And so right. even if you embrace the old paradigm, even if everything they're saying in the old paradigm is true, why would we limit ourselves only to reduction of emissions of fossil fuels. We have this at the, at the risk of sounding reductionist, we have this tool in the toolbox and it's called water and as water flows through ecosystems. It, it can be a tremendous tool for cooling the atmosphere until such time as we can get the other stuff done. Not only that, but, but the benefits of doing this redound first to the location in which it's done. To the localities, right. That's right, so. Flood control for one thing. Flood control, local cooling, mm -hmm. um, preventing forest fires and other fires from burning down your house. Mm -hmm. Right. In the long run, it's the secret to changing the global climate, but in the short run, it's the secret to insulating yourself from the problems that arise from land degradation. So it fits perfectly into what's called mitigation, which means a response to That's climate right. change as opposed to prevention. It, under any circumstances, this is also the way to mitigating the harmful effects of climate change. Exactly. The standard model but it's not says, merely that. It's not merely mitigate. You know, anyway, I'm well, sorry. Right. I, I interrupted. Go ahead. That's right. So what about plants? According to the standard model, we need to plant trees because plants draw down carbon. Yes, it's true. But they also, and more importantly, they refrigerate air, they hydrate the land, they prevent floods, fires, and famine, 
And by the way, they feed us. According to the standard model, water in the atmosphere is relatively unimportant. Frankly, the standard model has not really dealt successfully with water. But according to the living earth paradigm, water in the atmosphere is critical for cooling and life. And this makes a real difference, just as one example. There are controversies now about water management. Um, the standard model leads us to the intuition that if you slow water flow upstream, you're going to decrease the availability of water downstream. And so there are people in the valleys who object to slowing the flow of water upstream because they think it's gonna deprive us, deprive them of water. But in fact, exactly the opposite happens. Um, for a variety of reasons, slowing the water upstream increases the absorption of the water into the soil, which will eventually percolate downstream. But before it does, it produces foliage and plant life, which produces cooling, which not only causes local rain, but sucks rain in from the continents via a mechanism called the biotic pump, which leads to net increase of water drawn from the oceans that ends up in the land. But what the you're saying is, is, I want to repeat what you said, because it's really important. And that is that if you're if you're high up in the watershed, the conventional wisdom is that if you capture water on your land, then you are depriving people downstream of that water. But we know that if you capture water higher up, for one thing, it's not going to flood past you, uh, rushing into the streams, rivers, etc. And if it sinks into the ground gradually, it's going to support plant life. It is going to kind of create ecosystems up there, which are much more capable of, of absorbing rainfall and releasing it gradually downstream. So capturing more upstream leads to more downstream, not less. Exactly, exactly. Indeed, it even brings new water in from a continent away from the oceans because the condensation produces low pressure zones which suck air and moisture from off continent and brings more water and rain in. So the point is these two models take us in very different act directions when it comes to what should we do. And that's the risk we face. The standard model says that living things are victims of climate change. The living earth paradigm says they're not just victims, they control the climate. Mm -hmm. If you break the thermostat, it's going to get too hot, and then it's going to get too cold on a dead, dry, frozen planet. Mm -hmm. The standard model says humans cause climate change by burning fossil fuels. We say humans cause climate change by defoliating the planet and dehydrating the land. And the picture below which you're welcome to study, but I'm not gonna walk you through it. It points out that we're dealing with two cycles, one a vicious cycle, the other a virtuous, virtuous cycle. And we can go either way. One says it's gonna get hotter and hotter and drier and drier. And what rain you get is gonna produce floods. And that's the path we're on now. And the other says, that in intact bio, biospheric regions like the Amazon, we hope it will continue to be, you get a virtuous cycle in which rain and water and plants cool and nurture each other. And the conditions for life are maintained by living creatures. Our job, our imperative right now, is to push things towards the virtuous cycle and away from the vicious cycle we're now on. But to do that, we're gonna to have to recognize that the standard model is gonna take us in the wrong direction. 
that the living earth paradigm is going to tell us what to do and how to do it. And so this is not just a theoretical discussion. The implications for action, the actions we take are gonna take us in two very different directions. John, I think it would be worthwhile on the last slide just to, if I could read through some of those. Um, the standard model with respect to water and the atmosphere, it, the standard model says it's relatively unimportant. Uh, the living earth paradigm says it's critical for cooling and life. Uh, starting at the top, the standard model says that carbon in the atmosphere is the main problem. The living earth paradigm says that is a, it's a long-term problem, but a short-term obsession. The standard model with respect to how long it will take to restore uh, gr uh, greenhouse gas levels will take centuries and uh, the living earth paradigm says we can get normal temperatures in, in years. The standard model says that plants draw down carbon and not much else and they're victims of the uh, of so-called climate change which is you know exactly equated with greenhouse gases and fossil fuels. The living earth paradigm says that plants also, and more importantly, refrigerate air, hydrate land, prevent floods, fires, and, fam and famine. So I invite our audience to freeze the screen and scan the rest of those items. The two different models, which have uh, very different takes on the importance and role of plants, of water in the atmosphere, of slowing water upstream, et cetera. What causes deserts? Standard model says deserts are caused by drought. The living earth paradigm says that deserts are caused by bare ground because the bare ground can't absorb the rainfall. It rushes away and, and then it can no longer hold the rainfall, uh, can no longer hold water long enough to re-release some of it back into the water cycle etc. So all true. And virtually all of this can be um, reasoned out by virtue of the video that we showed earlier. It does lay out the causes and effects, but they're so counterintuitive that you may have to watch it several times or do further reading to become convinced that we understand this, that the proper understanding has very different implications for action and that we need to get on with it. Right. We don't want to get 10 years down the road and find out we've been listening to the wrong people, following the wrong people, trusting the wrong people. Not that they're bad people, but if they're leading us in the wrong direction, you know. Right. So, as I say, the living earth paradigm doesn't exactly contradict the standard model. But it says that these effects and this feedback loop are actually much different and have very different implications. If we let ourselves be guided just by the standard model, we're going to let ourselves be guided off the cliff. So the purpose of that slide was to say it's not either or, it's both and. Well, that's right. That's right. So. The standard model, by the way, because it's all about fossil fuels, implies that solutions have to come from the power elite, the big oil and the energy companies and the policymakers. The living earth paradigm says actually the solution has to come locally from almost everyone, almost everywhere, because it's a big planet. And that's and why we, we need say everyone who's got their feet on the ground to take responsibility for the piece of the ground they have their feet on. And if they do that, we're actually in good shape. Right. Which brings us to the last installment of our of this morning's sermon. All right. Um, we now have what we think is proper understanding. We now understand that. There are things we can do about this. And what we need to do is organize a global community. Indeed, almost everyone, almost everywhere 
to do what needs to be done. And so we've been working on this project, which I modestly call the big map to save the future. And I'm going to introduce it now because it's my hope that it can serve as an example and perhaps a mechanism for getting almost everyone, almost everywhere to do what needs to be done. Uh, you can get to this site, by the way, by going to tinyearl.com slash big map to save the future. And once you're there, you see our happy but suffering planet. Mm -hmm. You see a bunch of pins on the planet and every one of these pins represents some happy story of successful eco restoration performed by some hero of the modern age. There are pins all over the planet, which is to say eco restoration has been proven to work in almost every biome on the planet. And we have so far 800 stories of this sort, and you can find them in a variety of ways. And if you pick one of them, you'll get a story. If you click on the focus, you'll zoom into that location. And when you zoom in, <laughs> nice example, you'll see that these people have it figured out, but even this huge pro project is covering tiny patches of a very big planet. And so we need a way for almost everyone, almost everywhere to literally get on this map. Art, I've seen pictures of your backyard. <laughs> I am urging you to click on this button and nominate yourself. Give us a picture of your yard. Tell us where it's located. And there will be a new pin somewhere near Louisville, Kentucky, Kentucky which will tell your story and demonstrate that you too are an important part of the solution. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you. And anyone who's hearing this needs to go to tinyearl.com slash big map to save the future. And they too should say, you know, I've been listening to Hart's podcast for a while now. I have taken a patch of my yard and I'm now growing native plants and I'm harvesting water. And I would like to be able to show my friends that my humble corner of the planet is on the big map to save the future. And when I show my friends, I hope that they will be inspired to take responsibility for their piece of dirt. And that all of us together will eventually cover the planet with pins, cover the real planet with healthy soil, collectively restore the living systems that have maintained and created the very climate that we all depend on and indeed collectively save the future. And at some point, the power elites are going to run really fast in order to start leading those they were supposed to lead and happily ever after. But if we don't engage almost everyone, almost everywhere in effective action, guided by good understanding, by mutual support, and by the knowledge that they really do have the solution within their reach, it's going to be a perpetual stain on the history of those who are living today because it has fallen to us to get this right and to fix what we've done wrong up until now. And to do it in partnership, by the way, with the first peoples all over the world who have demonstrated that it is possible to live with the land, to live on the land and to 
be so grateful for what it gives us that you build the world philosophy on preserving and collaborating with it. That's what we all need to do. And we'd better get to it quickly. So that's my story. Well, that's wonderful. One, one thing I hear you saying, I wanna revisit the, the idea of agency. Agency is when there's something for everybody to do. And it's not only something that's useful and constructive, but it's beautiful and engaging. It, it, it tends to take us back. In my experience, it tends to take us back to kind of who we are and how we evolved. We evolved being close to the earth. And um, so I, I've had nothing but fun, you know, creating my little uh, restoring ecosystem and um it can be beautiful, ecological, and easy. It, it doesn't need to be hard. If you're working too hard at it, then you're probably not letting the rain, the sun, and the soil, and the plants do most of the work. But the rain, the sun, the soil, and the plants will do most of the work. And it's meaningful. It's meaningful on an individual basis because you're back in touch with a world of richness and complexity that modern life has uh, separated us from. And it's meaningful because for better or for worse, you are determining the future of the whole damn planet at a time of great peril. Sounds important and it is. <laughs> John, you have laid this out beautifully. I really appreciate your you know, making this distinction between the existing paradigm and the new water paradigm talking about agency, talking about all the ways in which um, the, you, you, the, the ways in which one paradigm looks at plants and sees one thing and the plants, droughts, floods, wildlife, water, all of those things are they, they, they can lead you in an entirely different direction depending on depending well, on you what. look at it. Right. John, thanks so much for joining me. This has been enlightening, challenging, and very practical. Uh, thank you, Art. It's really a pleasure. And I really appreciate your, uh, uh, your ability to underline and restate it in really clear terms. I hope that your uh, listeners and viewers will work on it too. There's more of this story to uncover and to tell and to act on. And all of those stories belong on, on the big map. Right. Um, because they deserve to be there because they're so important and they need to be there because they're so inspiring. So reach out to me or to Hart with tales of eco restoration, large and small, and help us fill in the picture and save the future. Sounds great. We'll do that. Thank you, Art.